Hello there. Welcome back to our book club for Bayes Rule. Well, we're going into the last couple of chapters here, and it looks like what we're doing is bringing a, a lot of our ideas together. So in the past couple of chapters, we looked at hierarchical models with the normal distribution along the way models without predictors, models with predictors. And now, as you can see here in chapter 18, we'll look at some situations that may call for non-normal distributions in, in their ideas. So our learning objectives include getting familiar with some of the modeling building blocks and to expand generalized hierarchical regression models by combining regression techniques with Poisson and negative binomial um, distributions. Before I forget, I want to thank uh, folks in the previous cohorts for making these lecture slides. The data set we're gonna be looking at um, Right now, um, as with the previous chapter or two, this chapter has a couple of data sets for us to consider. One data set is looking at folks who have tried to climb through the Himalayan mountains. So as we know, the Himalayan mountains are the highest in the world and is quite an endeavor to try to reach the peak. So let's look at the data set. Which is, I believe, included in the Bayes rules package. We're going to grab this data set, look at the expedition identification number, the member identification number, whether or not the ascent to the top was a success or not, the year, the season, age, role, uh, whether or not th the person was a, a guide or, or the folks that were running the trip in terms of the payments, and whether or not oxygen was used along the way, oxygen tanks. For brevity, we'll call this set climbers or this data set climbers. And the data are from the Himalayan database and was featured back in on Tidy Tuesday back in uh, 2000. We have over 2000 observations and this data goes back to 1978. Here is a glimpse at the data set. We can see that the role includes the climbers, the doctors, the leaders, and maybe a few other roles there. And in particular, going after the response variable, uh, what we're going to try to predict is whether or not the climbers succeeded. So in this data set, about 39% of climbers did succeed, reach the top, whereas the other 61% did not. For the first couple of columns, the reason why we have separate expedition and member IDs is that there are multiple people in a team. So we are observing about 200 different expeditions or 200 different teams. So for example, this 
expedition had five climbers. This expedition had six. This one had 12. When we dive into the data, we see that over 75 of the expeditions had a 0% success rate. It, that is, in each expedition, each team of climbers, there is a possibility that some of them continued all the way to the top while others decided to discontinue the endeavor. And we find that about 20 expeditions had their entire team reach the top of the mountain for a 100% success rate, 20 expeditions out of 200. And when we look at the distributions with those ideas in mind, here's what we get. So again, there are many expeditions where 0% of the climbers reach the top. They're on the far left. On the right, we had some expeditions where the entire team reached the top for a 100% success rate. And then in the middle, some expeditions where, again, some climbers reached the top while others decided to discontinue. Let's go ahead and look at our variables in, in for as for modeling. We're going to use the Bernoulli model binary binary response variable, whether or not the climber reached the top. Uh, yes versus no. Uh, these numbers might be switched. X i j one the age of climber J and the age of climber I in expedition J and XIJ2, the age of the, whether or not climber I received oxygen in expedition J. As with the rest of the textbook, we'll consider a Bayesian model the response variable itself being zero or one will have a Bernoulli response. And as with the rest of unit four here in the last few chapters, we're gonna be utilizing a complete pooling structure. Putting these ideas together, we're building a logistic regression model, but with these coefficients in mind. Beta naught will be the typical baseline success rate across all expeditions. Beta one will be the global relationship between success and age when control and function use. Beta two will be the global success rate between success and oxygen use when controlling for age. Recall that in the logistic regression model, we have our usual coefficients and variables set up, but we set that equal to the log odds on the other side of the equation. And Going towards the complete pooling, we need to consider the grouping structure of the data. So here we have a look of, we take our data, group by age and oxygen use. We have uh, this here. The yellow dots correspond to climbers who were given oxygen tanks. The purple dots correspond to climbers who for go or did not use the oxygen tanks, success rate um, towards the top indicates or heavily implies that the success in reaching the top of the mountains um, 
relied heavily on the use of the oxygen. Now for the distributions themselves, we can consider a centered intercept with a normal distribution with some mean and variance. Based on the data, we could eventually get some good estimates for our priors. For each expedition, we're assuming independence between them, also normal distributed, along with an overall variance. Since that's non-negative, we'll use an exponential distribution. A curious approach that we may have discussed before is we're going to reframe the random intercepts as tweaks to the global intercept. So here we have an overall success rate, the typical baseline success rate. And then we have an adjustment to talk about the success rate for each expedition, each team of, of climbers, whether or not the success rate might be higher or lower than the typical. So this will be an adjustment, maybe positive, maybe negative where the adjustment itself depends on the variability. So in this point of view, sigma naught captures the between group variability of success rates from expedition to expedition. And since we're making these adjustments for each expedition on the, since we're making the adjustments on the intercept, our model equation is adjusted this way. And we could also put that into our R code, say in the stand GLM function. So putting these ideas together, we see we have a climber's data set, we have our binomial response, our centered intercept for the prior, for the coefficients. And we talked last time about the covariance matrix. And as we've been doing for several chapters now, where the textbook authors recommend for us a four chain MCMC simulation with twice than 5,000 iterations, 5,000 iterations for the quote unquote burn-in stage and then 5,000 iterations for what we're gonna retain in our cute base seed. As was prior chapters, the textbook authors recommend at this point, if you are running these codes, to run your prior summary to see how the numbers are unfolding at the beginning, to run your MCMC diagnoses, to double check that the simulations are running in a reasonable way. We, for brevity, We'll go ahead and assume all of this worked out pretty well, move on. Quickly defining success rate. We say that the climbers were successful was a one, otherwise zero. And in base R, there's a nice way of saying that you could simply take the average of all these ones and zeros, and that will be your success rate. When we look at all that together, our posterior predictive check will produce the 
distribution there in the light blue, the baseline success rate in the dark blue vertical line. And we could see that th these ideas seem to be lining up pretty well. Thus, our model seems to be a good idea for modeling the Himalayan mountain climbers. With that, with all the diagnosis in place and assurance that our model is good, we should also mention that there should be some thoughts to the ethics of it all, whether or not the model is fair. To the best of our knowledge, the information was gathered voluntarily. We are considering climbers only in this particular mountain range, this particular part of the of the world. And and then going back and asking numbers about that. So we don't have to worry about generalizations too much. And therefore the model itself would probably be fair. And then this posterior predictive check implies to us that the model is good as well. With those ideas in mind, we could go ahead and try to interpret our results and perform some posterior analyses. Our posterior summaries will reveal the likelihood of success um, decreases with age. We we'll see that in action. Take the climbing models, look for the fixed effects, maybe look for a 80% credible interval. Remember that in the logistic regression, the numbers we get are the log odds. So to invert that, we exponentiate whatever number was on the low end of the confidence interval, whatever number was on the high end of the confidence interval where the probabilities came from our logistic form. When we control for oxygen, whether or not that the climbers had oxygen, the probability of success decreases with age. Let me see if I could bring up that image. So we're looking at this image here from the online textbook. Sorry. We have the folks who were given oxygen tanks on the light blue, the folks who um, did without the oxygen tanks in the dark black. And once again, um, controlling for that, the probability of success seems to decrease for both groups um, with age. So now with the model in place, uh, we ask ourselves, well, what if there's an, a new group of climbers? Uh, will they be successful in reaching the top of the mountain? Let's consider some new expeditions. We have in this group, uh, think about the main variables we're looking at today. A couple of climbers at the age of 20, a couple of climbers at the age of 60. So. Um, looking at the ages. 
and then false true, false true for whether or not they're utilizing the oxygen tanks. When we run this new data frame through the Quiman model, get the posterior predictions, we see that success was found only in the hypothetical climbers who did have access to oxygen. So the 20 year old without oxygen had about a, has a prediction of success at about 28%. The 20 year old with oxygen has about an 80% chance of success. The 60 year old without oxygen has about a 15% chance of success. The 60 year old with oxygen has about a 65% success chance. From there, you could think about the model evaluation a little bit more. At first, uh, when you're doing your Bernoulli investigation, you have your success rates or your thought about the success rates between zero and one. At first, you might put, put your cutoff between whether you think a future climber will be successful or not. You might put your cutoff at 0.5 and see how that goes. You could um, experiment, try out different numbers for the cutoff until your model seems to do a good job on predicting with the historical um, data. And we find that perhaps using a cutoff around 0.65 would do a better job of predicting success for the future climbers. Okay, so let's look at another data set. We're going to look at Airbnb. That is uh, folks who rent out um, houses, rooms, ex extra space through this um, service called Airbnb. This particular investigation will look at uh, uh, such rentals in... Chicago neighborhoods, Chicago being a city in the middle of the United States. We have 1,561 observations in 43 neighborhoods. Now, what we're going to look for is the number of reviews for a particular location, for particular locations um, being advertised on Airbnb. This is actually a proxy for how popular the location is as far as rentals are concerned. The number of reviews hopefully correlates to the number of times that a location gets rented. So again, we're using this as kind of a proxy. We have a power law. Some locations get many reviews, but the distribution drops off pretty quickly. And number of reviews actually tends to be quite low. Looking at the ratings, most people rate their Airbnb um, time of uh, Five out of five, I'm assuming five is the, the best. Some 4.5, some fours, and so forth. And when we look at the type of rooms offered, sometimes you have a whole entire home or apartment. Sometimes you have a private room and sometimes you have a shared room. And that might also affect the number of reviews that a place gets. <clears throat> 
For brevity, we'll be looking at three neighborhoods in the Chicago region. One called Albany Park, one called East Garfield Park, and one called The Loop. We could see that, generally speaking, places in Albany Park and East Garfield Park get a relatively low number of reviews. Whereas there are a few more locations in the loop that are quite popular. So we're going to look at this Airbnb model running this through our uh, stand function. We're going to look for a response being the number of reviews. In contrast to the Himalayan data, reviews is a numerical variable going from zero to several hundred. Since that's non-negative, we're going to consider a Poisson model. And we're basing this on ratings, room types, and we're going to have adjusted intercepts for neighborhoods. Now, the reason why neighborhood gets to be the grouping variable for our complete polling model is because these neighborhoods are a sample of, of the number of neighborhoods in the Chicago region. I should have mentioned in the previous example, the expedition team was the grouping variable for their complete pulling model because it's treated as a sample. Whereas um, here in the Airbnb setting, we know that the ratings go from zero to five. We know all the room types. And when we know all the categories for a group and variable, that's actually probably not part of the hierarchical models thinking. But again, since neighborhood is treated as a sample here, that's what's going to lend itself possibly to the hierarchical models. Running a centered baseline intercept, also normal distributions for the priors of the other coefficients and our usual co covariance matrix and MCMC -MC simulation. At this point, the textbook authors remind us to do our diagnoses and posterior predictive checks. I think that will probably look better over here. Looking at the online textbook, admittedly. We could use some of the help, helper functions along the way to help us get the initial values for the priors. But when we perform the posterior predictive check, we see that the number of reviews there in the dark line, whereas our MCMC simulations are producing the distribution in the light blue, and we get a sense that these are not lining up just yet. So before we venture on to ideas such as making predictions or describing the housing or rental market in general, we should probably make sure that the model is doing well with the data so far and the picture in front of us implies that it does not. 
as the section title implies, we're looking at the Poisson and negative binomial. The mathematics is similar to something we discussed about before. When we try a Poisson regression, when we're trying the Poisson distribution, one of the assumptions is that the expected value and the variance are equal, or at least um, practically close to equal. However, uh, because again, in this situation here in the left graph, the number of reviews could vary qu quite a bit. So the power law, a few locations get many reviews, many locations get few reviews. And it leads to a situation like this here in the dark line, where we have a very large variance. And we call, we call that over dispersion. Removing this assumption that the variance should be close to the expected value, we want a more flexible model and we then use the negative binomial. where we have a in the reciprocal dispersion parameter that's also modeled with non-negative numbers via an exponential distribution. So we update our model, now thinking perhaps a negative binomial is the way to go. We have uh, this new line here for that in for that reciprocal um, dispersion parameter. And this time around, the simulations and the light blue seem to line up better with the real results in the dark line. Now, with the model in place, the negative binomial model seem to do pretty well. We could do our posterior analyses. Once again, going after 80% confidence intervals. This might take a while on your computer. So the folks who made these lecture slides um, advise us maybe to borrow the results from the textbook authors themselves. When we run the posterior predictions over those three neighborhoods, we could then get a, a sense of how many people leave reviews for their Airbnb locations in those three neighborhoods. Then finally, to close out the chapter, we could have model evaluations. We have our, our MAE metric. This number here um, is useful if you have multiple models and you need to compare them to each other. The mean absolute error, you want that to be relatively small, at least compared to other models. And we also have our percentile calculations. We want about 50% of the observation to be with in the 50 percentile confidence interval. We want about 95% of the observations to be within the 95 percentile confidence interval. And this seems to be working out pretty well. That is chapter 14.
join us next time when we will continue to bring all these ideas together by finally adding more layers to our Bayesian models. See you then.